So, good morning. Let's try it. Good morning. Okay, that's better. Um, so, do we have other mics? I, I wanna, I wanna actually talk a little bit. With it. Yeah, get ready. You, you'll have to run. Um, so, I wanna start by asking you guys something. What's a system according to you? When it comes to communities or whatever, there are many definitions for systems. So, um, what's a system? Someone? Hence, there's one. Oh. Run, run. It's just morning. A group of companions that work together towards a common goal? That's season, yeah. Someone else? One more, one more. There are three questions, so I need at least two answers for each one. Um, probably just uh, organize a group of processes. Yes, that's, that's pretty accurate, actually. Um, so when it comes to communities, when it comes to cultures, um, a system is, is a means to empower people, humans, actually, to, to be amazing. There are all the processes that you put in place uh, for the members of your community to actually be able to do something and to actually reach that goal, that common goal that um, it was mentioned before. So um, what's culture? According to you, when it comes to community, when it comes to um, socializing, come on, culture, come on, help me out here. Okay, there's one. We need a mic. <laughs> mic. The, the rules that define how the culture works or how the system works. Yes, yes, that's quite accurate. Someone else. One more. There's one. There's a hand. It's a common set of conventions that allow people to coexist. Also. And um, yes, that's that's actually pretty accurate. So um, the culture when it comes to communities and, and, and the process and the systems you actually put in place for, for humans to be amazing. The culture is, is the way they are actually gonna do things. Um, you can have all the processes you want in place, you can have all the systems you like. But the culture is the one that's gonna define how people actually act in your system, how people are actually gonna do something. Um, and we'll get we'll get into more details here. Uh, one more question. This is the last one, I promise. Uh, but I'm Italian. Don't take my word. Um, <laughs> what's flexibility? <laughs> flexibility. So on. There's. You'll get a drink after this talk. I promise you that. The ability to change your culture and slash or system in response to external requirements. Awesome. You're on a roll, sir. <laughs> it's taking my talk away. Do you want to talk? So I can give you the mic right now. Someone else, one more. In the back, people in the back are very silent. Someone? Come on, this is the easiest. Okay, whatever. You're, not, you're getting a drink. I'm buying it. So uh, flexibility is actually the level of tolerance you, you have in your system uh, to, to cope with variance. Um, so it's, it, flexibility is how, how you cope with variance when it comes to having a set of processes that you expect people to actually follow and different cultures that determine or, or, or say how people are actually gonna act in your system or how people are gonna actually um, use your processes. Um, and of course you have to have some flexibility in your system. Of course, you have to uh, be tolerant to variance. And if there's anything that I want you to take out of this talk, is this slide here. So if you read this and you think that you're done with it, you can just leave the room, it's fine. I'm not gonna say anything more interesting than this, probably. But, um, but I'm gonna read this. Um, I, I never read my slides, but I'm gonna read this one. It says, you must tolerate variance in your community to empower humans from any culture, hopefully any culture, to be amazing in your community. So this is the key, like you have different cultures, you have systems and processes that your community have to follow, has to follow to actually do something, but you have to be torn into various. Um, and this is the only slide that has that many words. I normally don't put that many words in the slides. So I'm Fabio, um, or Fabio 87 in this thing that I think is gonna be very successful called the internet. Um, and, and if you wanna follow me, that's my Twitter handler. And this is growing your community without time, or how to cope with growth, or um, what to do when you want to have a community and you want to kind of manage it. Um, 
that's me when I was young and stupid. I'm not just stupid. Um, and um, I normally don't care if you want to ask questions in the middle of my talk, but since we're kind of like a little bit like off time here, um, I'm probably just gonna run through my talk. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's very amazing. Thank you all for having me here. It's actually my first time in Cape Town. It's actually my first time in South Africa, so um, I was quite excited to come here. Um, again, that's my Twitter handler. If you like this talk, I love feedback. So if you like this talk, feel free to just tweet me or email me if you prefer. Um, if you don't like this talk, that is not my Twitter handler and that is not my email address. <laughs> just forget my name. Um, <laughs> jokes apart, like if, you, if there's something that you think we could improve but I could improve in my talk or you just disagree with some of the things I'm gonna say, um, just say it. Couple of disclaimers before we get more into, into the actual content. Um, I tend to speak very fast. Um, it, that's, uh, not, that has nothing to do with being up here. It's just because I'm, I'm, I'm from Caracas and that's nowadays the most dangerous city in the world. So I have to somehow, somehow survive there. Um, so, and I normally say bad words, no, the panel advisor, explicit content and other things. So don't take it on me. It's not, I don't do that on purpose, uh, but I, I do like dropping that bombs. Um, <laughs> and it just makes it more exciting for me. Um, <laughs> And also, before we actually get into the content, I don't have a magic wand for you. So if you're if, if you're expecting to get out this stuff, like the secret sauce to actually make your community to go from five people to five thousand people, uh, you're in the wrong room. I don't have that magic wand, but I can tell you how to actually uh, deal with uh, your growing community when you, when it is starting to go from five people to ten, and then then to one hundred, and hopefully to one thousand and five thousand people. Um, I hope I, I really hope that you know the concept of this talk would be useful uh, for you. So these processes, all the processes that we've been talking about um, in the last I don't know ten minutes, um, the community is actually is the actually entity that creates these processes. Um, even even if you don't know that you have processes, you actually have processes. Like the way you merge code, that's a process. The way you review code. Uh, whether you required at least two core reviewers to review your code before you merge it, that's a process that your community has. The way you communicate with the rest of the community, that, those are processes that you've put in place to actually cope with uh, the chaos of your growing community or just the chaos of managing your community, just managing your community. And, and the community creates those. And you, don't, you don't have other people coming to you and telling you what you have to do. Um, you, you, you talk to your community and you kind of like evolve from not having any process at all to actually having some ways to do things because remember that these processes that constitute your system are supposed to make your life simpler and they are supposed to allow humans for being amazing. So you don't want to be in the middle of the process, right? And these processes are a way of governance. And I know many people are many people are allergic to governance. You know, like when, whenever you hear governance in an open source community, you're all like, "Oh my God, I don't want to get into that." Uh, but it turns out the processes, having processes and having systems that actually, can, you know, determine how your community behaves and how things happen in your community, that's a way of governance. And governance has nothing to do with bureaucracy. It's completely different. Um, governance has nothing to do with politics. Politics is something completely different. Like governance is just the way you govern your communities, are all the systems that you put in place, again, to actually cope with the chaos. And many communities have, um, have um, governance models. It doesn't really matter what governance model you, you, you want to follow. It can be you have a technical committee in your community. You can also have a BDFL. Um, and it doesn't really matter. It's, it's up to you, it's up to your community to actually decide what kind of like, governance model they want to have. The important thing is that you eventually need one because you eventually need to distribute the load and you have to delegate many things that are happening in your community to actually be able uh, to, uh, or actually for allowing your community to just grow. Um, so again, like many communities have, uh, have um, governance models, like the OpenStack community has a governance model, which is uh, where I spend most of my time these days. The Kubernetes community has, and the Python community, of course, has, has a governance model. So if you would ask my, my personal opinion on this, I would say like try to avoid um, BDFLs and you know, single people uh, governing, if you will, uh, the entire community and instead go for elected bodies that will help you out. 
But um, of course, every every governance model that you pick will have uh, some trade-offs and some benefits and some drawbacks for your community. Um, it, it gets funny as it grows. But essentially, governance is, is necessary. And the best you can do to help your community grow, or as soon as you see your community is growing, is to actually accept it. Accept that you will have to have some kind of governance. Accept that you have to put these processes in place and start working on that. Um, just don't go crazy for the very beginning. Uh, we'll, we'll see a little bit more about that later. But accept that you need governance. Uh, and, and of course, like, Something really important is that governance does not invalidate the opinions of other people. Um, again, like governance has nothing to do with bureaucracy, uh, but not really has nothing to do, but it's not bureaucracy and it's not politics. And having a governance model does not mean that other members of your community cannot um, have an opinion on what's going on or, or even intervene and help you out with some other stuff. And when I say you, I mean you all. I, I don't mean you as a single person. I mean you as an entire community, as a governance. Um, entity in your community. So it is super important to understand this um, and to make it clear to the rest of the community that the fact that there are processes and that maybe some people have some roles and some other people have, have different roles does not mean that some, you know, that the only opinions that matter are the set of, are the opinions of the people that are actually part of this governance model. Yeah. And still on the governance topic, um, the growth of your community is more evident when there's actually a governance model on it. And this goes along with accepting that you need some kind of governance to actually uh, help your community grow. And, you know, when you start when you start your project, and I talk about projects like code projects because I'm a, I'm a developer, in case you didn't know it. Um, but the community does not need to be just around, um, around code. You can have a Python community here. Uh, that doesn't necessarily work around a single project, but you just want to build a Python community here. And, and again, like growth is evident when you start putting all these governance, uh, or all these systems and all these processes in place for your, uh, for your community to actually cope with the, with the growth. And the more processes you have, it's a, so the more processes and the bigger your system is, does not mean your community is actually bigger. So you have to have a balance in there. Um, how many, um, how complex your processes are, how complex your system is, and you want to keep it simple, like everything else. Like the fact that your community has 5,000 people does not mean that you have to have a very complex process or system to actually get a patch in. Um, so one question you, you probably want to ask yourself is like, how, how much can I grow my own community before I get into adding more and more uh, system, more processes into, into my community? So like, Ask yourself how hard it is for new contributors to actually be part of my community. How hard it is for new people to come in and, and start making changes and start and, and start being part of the community. And being part of the community does not mean again like does not mean just pushing patches to your project. It means writing documentation. It means making sure that you know things work, like helping out with the test environment and infrastructure. There are many ways, many different ways to actually contribute to a project. Um, and you gotta ask yourself how hard it is to act for, for those new people in your community to actually onboard themselves. Is, is the process clear enough? Is, for instance, like we had this, we used to have, or still, um, the CLA for um, the contrib Contributors License Agreement for OpenStack. So um, after several years of people suffering to figure out how to actually sign the CLA and be able to push their first patch, they had to open like, three different accounts, one on Launchpad, one on Garrett, and one somewhere else, and then pray to the gods, and then sign the CLA, and eventually they'll be able to actually merge a batch, or actually submit a batch, not even merge it. Um, so that, that, was a, that was a huge problem for us. And, and it was a problem for, for several years, because four years. And, and yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so the technical community said like, Fuck this! It's like we don't, we don't, we don't really want our new contributors to actually suffer. We need more contributors. We need more people that are submitting code because you know there are so many different areas that people can contribute to, and and we want them to do that. So, so we started working on having a, a developer certificate of origin. It's a weird, you know, set of words to just say sign your freaking commit and we're done. Um, so. 
we pushed that and we talked to the, the lawyers at the Open Star Foundation and you know, we started working on that. Um, and uh, we eventually we got them to agree. I, I don't, to be honest, I don't know how far we're, we, we are right now on, on actually switching out the CLA, but I think we're getting closer there. Like at least we got them to actually agree and find a legal way to make it happen. But I'm not saying it's not important, there's an actual foundation behind OpenStack, but um, what I'm saying is that the process for these new people to actually start contributing to OpenStack was so hard that we were losing them. And, and even if you have people from other cultures that probably are not familiar with CLAs and DCOs and all that. So just, just keep that in mind. And, and while you keep that in mind, remember that these processes and the system you're building that you're setting up is, is for, for making things easier to your community. So if you have different entities in your community that are responsible for different areas, like if you have a technical committee, an infrastructure team, and a Q&A team, and all that, remember that you don't want to be on their way. You don't want to be, uh, you don't want to have teams that are actually the bottleneck for your community. And if everything has to go through, uh, through a single team to actually happen, then you are creating, you know, that's not gonna scale. You, you're creating extra processes and you're making things harder for your community. So a good solution is like get rid of get rid of some of those processes or just reinvent them so that things are easier. Uh, and it used to be a problem for us as well. You know, you know it's like we, we without getting into the details of the history of why things happened the way they happened, we used to have a something that we call the integrated release, where just a set of projects were there, and you know, a compute project and network and all. How, how many of you are familiar with OpenStack? I want to know, like, uh, a few hands. Okay, cool. Anyway, like, so we had this integrated release that had just a set of projects, but we we understood that the community actually wanted to outgrow that set of projects. We understood, like, we saw the community proposing new ideas, different projects that were like. 100 100% compliant with the projects that were part of the integrator release. So, what happened is that some members of the community said, like, well, you know, that this is probably not right, and we're blocking these projects for actually doing something useful for the community, so let's reinvent the whole thing. And, and the way the governance model works now is that it's way easier for these projects to actually get into, into the OpenStack Foundation and build OpenStack uh, releases. And, and and be part of the community. So we lowered the bar. We removed all the you know you need to be approved to actually like well you still need to be approved, but the, the bar is, is way lower. Uh, so we removed all that process that made it super hard for people to actually uh, get into the community. And we welcome welcome uh, a whole lot of new projects. So definitely don't have any entities or bodies in your community that are the bottleneck for uh, for people to become part of data or to actually get things done. Um, and, and of course, if you don't want if you don't want any entities to actually be the bottleneck in your community, you have to, you gotta make sure that your governance model actually follows your community. You want to be, and, and it doesn't have to be the other way around. So, whatever governance model you have, whatever governance entities you have in your community, those are supposed to oversee the community, and it's not the community that has to oversee those governance models. So if you have a technical committee, if you have an infrastructure team, the infrastructure team has to oversee all the things related to infrastructure. And, and if you stop overseeing the community, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to help. And, and I guess the point is, if, if you, like, having control on the community is not what you really want, right? If you, if you, if you, if you put some, um, some, like too much control in your community, and you're not allowing your community to actually evolve and change things. Uh, you're not really overseeing your community. You're just like literally just managing it, like you would do in any you know organization. And you don't want that. You want your community to actually evolve and to actually um, um, improve itself. And and of course, if to, to follow your community, you you have to know your community. You have to know who the members of your community are. Um, and I'm not saying that like, you have to know like every member, like the name of everyone, but you gotta know what kind of users or what kind of uh, community members you have. Are they are they developers? Are they operators? Are they just watchers, like people that literally just watches the progress of the project and see if it will do something interesting someday? So you have many different kind of uh, community members, and you gotta know them. You gotta know what they're doing. You gotta know uh, a little bit about you know 
um, what the metrics are, how many of each do you have, because each one of them has a different opinion of the things that ha should happen in your community or in your project specifically. Each one of those groups have different ideas and, and approach problems in different ways. And eventually users will outgrow your, the other members, because you know when your projects start growing and your community starts doing something, you'll have more and more users, hopefully, and, and that's awesome. You, you want users to be there. You want users to actually provide their opinions. You want users to, sorry. Uh, you want users to, to, to let you know what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. You want to you, you wanna listen to everyone. And, and the fact that you have many users is, is, is very sexy, but is also uh, very dangerous because you might get into, you might make the mistake of not listening to other people that have uh, more, you know, super interesting opinions and super inter interesting thoughts about the things that should or should not happen in your community. And what, what's wrong with this? Okay. Uh, yeah. So and, and and you gotta listen to everyone. You gotta listen to every single member of your community. So you have to have the proper means to, for your community to actually provide opinions and and thoughts about the things that should or should not happen in your community. And, and listening to everyone is exhausting, right? So um, I, I would say, like, listening to everyone does not mean that you have to make everyone happy. You you cannot do that. But you, you gotta have a way to actually filter the information that are actually useful for your community. So again, like, if we go back to users, as the users, I might have many different ideas that are useful just for me. Some of those ideas might be shared by other members of the community, but some are not. So you gotta make sure that every time that you address the feedback from other members of your community, and this is not, a, like addressing feedback is not about just implementing new features. It is always a, it's also about changing things in your community. You're changing the processes of your community. So people might have like super interesting ideas, but you cannot make everyone happy. So at some point you will have to make hard decisions. And, and tough calls. But more importantly, we're customers of each other. Whenever we're part of a different community, it doesn't matter if it is the uh, community of five people or 10 people or 100,000, we're all customers of each other. Each one of us do different things in the community and we've got to make sure that we keep that relation and that communication in place so that we remember that the things that I'm doing might also affect other people in the community and the things they are doing might affect them. So if we have a technical committee again, like, or if we have an infrastructure team or a QA team, the evolution and the progress of that QA team is important for me as well, as a normal random developer on some other project. Um, and it's, again, like, it doesn't matter how big your community is. You, you can also have just a single project in your, in, in your community, and you can all be working on that one. But still, the, the decisions that reviews the comments that other people make on other on patches or merge requests, whatever, it, is, it, it affects me. So I gotta make sure that the things that I do are also useful for you and the things that you do are also useful for me so we can all benefit from it and we can all be happy hippies. Um, <laughs> keep it humble and, and objective. And so personality has a huge influence on the former. Like being humble is not something that, um, you know, like that is natural to everyone. Like, not you. You can tell people. You can tell people how to behave, which is why many communities and every community actually or conferences have COCs. You can tell people how to behave, but you cannot tell people how to think. And I'm still in this sentence from, from from a friend of mine that actually said it like two days ago, and it was amazing. It blew my mind. And and it actually it makes a lot of sense. So like you you gotta make sure to keep your community as humble as possible, so that other of uh, members of your community uh, feel feel welcome, and and I think David said this before. Like, treat other people as you would like to be treated. I mean, that's cool, but that's also dangerous because if I'm a jerk and I don't mind people treating me, you know, like with arrogance or something, I might do the same thing to other people. So um, I actually have a, a blog post on this, and and it's more um, explicit than what I'm gonna say now. But just like fuck jerks. Uh, you gotta, you gotta keep your community nice, and you gotta make sure that um, that people are treated in what's, um, if you will, morally correct, as in, in the open source world. Um, just define it as you want. But what's probably easier 
um, in, in many of the things we do is be an objective because you can measure many things and you can make more objective decisions based on those measurements. Um, there are some things that are very hard to get uh, to get right. There are so many decisions and many changes in your community that are really hard to keep objective. Um, sometimes you will have to make subjective decisions, but just make sure that it's not just one person making them. Make sure there's a there's a group of people and that opinions from everyone are are being listened to. And to be objective, um, I mean, if you don't have clear expectations, you cannot expect people to actually be objective or, or behave in a certain way. So expectations are, it, it, can, mean, it can mean many things. Um, when, when it comes to communities, expectations are, are the mission of your project or your community, the vision of your project or your community. So the vision is where you see yourself or your community in a couple of years from now or in a, month, in a couple of months from now. The mission is the actual goal that you want to get your community to. So you gotta, you gotta have like clear expectations, like even even on the way you merge code, you have to have like clear expectations of how you expect people to review code, how you expect people to approve patches, how you expect people to to interact with each other. So if you don't have clear expectations, there's no good way to actually have uh, objective decisions being made. Um, so you can have expectations on behavior, you can have expectations on how people contribute, you can have expectations on the goals of your community, and. And sometimes being open is, is not is not is not really enough. Um, you can have awesome expectations, but you also have to allow the outcome from for all those processes to be affected by your community. Um, one thing to understand is that the fact that you have um, governance bodies or entities in your community um, is it, great, but not many people are actually interested in that. So. Taking as an example the OpenStack community, uh, we we have probably too many, but um, but it's, like it's a it, it's a big community and it's working for us so far. So we have technical community, we have the infrastructure team and the QA team and a whole bunch of other teams. And the fact that we have all these teams, it doesn't mean that everyone cares about them. You know, not everyone cares about being in technical community. Don't not not everyone cares about contributing to infrastructure or the QA project. So. The fact that you have all these entities does not mean that um, that people actually care about it. But you have to be open to everyone, and you have to be uh, to allow people to actually affect the changes. So, if the technical committee is about to make a decision, that's going to, so the technical committee in OpenStack actually uh, is a, is the entity that oversees the entire committee. So, um, changes and decisions made in this committee um, actually affect the entire community. So. The fact that you have this technical committee, which is elected like elected twice per year, um, doesn't mean that uh, the opinions of other people in the community are not important. And you have to allow these other people that don't really care about being in the technical community to actually affect the changes and affect the outcomes when they actually care. There are some topics they are interested in too, and there are some other topics they just don't give a fuck. So uh, for those topics that they are actually interested in too, you have to allow people to out affect the outcome. And a good way to do that is to include the, the community on, on setting the expectations. Um, you have to, you can get the community to actually help you out to set all the expectations. Um, the mission statement, the vision of where you see um, your community in a couple of months from now, the way you match with like, you can have the rest of the community to actually contribute to that. You don't have to have a single entity doing that because remember, otherwise you will be just controlling uh, the entire process, and you don't want that. You want everyone to be happy to peace and get things done. I'm sorry. Um, and as you're setting your expectations in the community, as you're applying new processes and creating new processes, a good rule or something we learned the hard way is to set the bar at a reasonable level. It is. It is very tempting when you're creating these new processes, when you're creating these new systems, it is very, very tempting to just set the bar super high, super high, sorry, and, and create a list of expectations that you're, you're not really able to, um, to cope with, you're not able to even reach yourself. So keep the bar low enough, keep, start from something that you know you can achieve, and then start, um, you know, moving the bar a little bit higher as you go and as your community grows and as you actually need them. Everything that you put in your expectations, everything that you require your community to do or to be or to behave like, are things that are gonna affect the growth of your community. So if you put more things in there that you actually need, you're gonna affect the growth of your community. Because having expectations uh, is actually having a contract. 
So the things that you put in there are things that you are supposed to respect. You are supposed to um, to to stay behind with. Um, so again, like don't make the mistake. Like we can take again the the, the, the example I said before. Like when we had this integrated release, uh, we set the bar like super high for many projects to actually get into the community. And whether that was a mistake or not, whether that was a um, you know conscious decision at the very beginning or not, uh, it's not really important here. The, pro the, the important part is that we, we realized after a couple of years that there were all these other projects that had awesome ideas that also wanted to be part of the community and they couldn't be part of the community because the, the bar was was set like way too high for them. And I'm, by way too high, I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, the projects were not complex enough or whatever crap you want to put in there. It's just like, the bar was set into a point or was defined in a way that these projects didn't make sense in the community, but they actually did, so we had to change the, the, the whole thing. So, as you, as you set all your expectations and as you, as, you, as you write down your contract, um, the key for actually making it possible for the community to follow it is to communicate it properly. And communication is something that um, is it's probably it's probably one of the hardest things, actually. Um, communicating properly uh, the things, the expectations of your community, the changes you're making, um, the, the way you expect people to behave, or your COCs and all that, it is not, it's not as simple as just having a web page that has the, the content in. Um, it, it, it might be tempting to just put it in there and expect people to actually go and read it, but communication, communicating uh, things properly and, and making sure that people uh, you know, are aware of, of the expectations of their community or the way your community works um, is probably one of the keys for actually helping your community to grow because as, as soon as I learn how the community works, I can also teach other people and I can also start working on improving it or, or changing the processes that actually uh, constitute the community that I'm part of. And it is sometimes better to just over communicate and by over-communicating, I'm not saying that you should spam the hell out of people. Um, that is not cool. Uh, not cool at all. <laughs> um, but by over-communicating, I mean you have to send these notifications of this uh, information about your community um, often enough to people. You have to send them in different means. Like you, you can send them a mailing list, you can have blog posts talking about it, you can have other members of the community talking about it, you can have people um, you know, going to conferences. And, and you know, make it make it the processes of your community so exciting that people actually want to talk about them. Um, that is that is that is one of the goals you, you you should set yourself for. And and it is great when it actually happens. And there are some there are some like, some things that you want to communicate very often, and some other things that you can just communicate once. Like for for instance, like the mission, the vision of your community. Um, are, are things that you want to revisit uh, from time to time. And especially if you have a growing community, uh, the key is in the growing part. You have new members in your community that not, might not be aware of the things or the way their community works. So if you expect that people actually know how your community works, you're falling a little bit behind there. You gotta make sure that you cannot assume people know um, the expectations of your community. You cannot assume uh, that people know how your community works. You've got to make it sure that people can find out how your community works. And from time to time, I also remind the community. So, talking about the mission, the vision, and, and all these um, fancy things um, from time to time with the rest of the community is actually it actually helps to uh, to see if you are still on track. If there are things we actually have to change in your community. And. Unfortunately, like over communicating and having different ways to communicate the expectations and, and, and processes and the governance models of your community, it does not it does not get rid of surprises. You will still have people that are surprised about some things. You will still have like weird faces when some of the uh, processes and changes are are put in place. Like you can make a decision, make the change, and then you'll have people coming over like, hey, this, this is not used to be like that, and you're like, well, we we said that like four months ago that we were going to change it. Uh, you're not going to get rid of that. But that doesn't mean that you have to stop of, you know, communicating things. Um, the, fact that you, the fact that you have surprise faces, the fact that you have people that um, are, are, are not fully aware of everything that's happening in your community does not mean that you're lacking of transparency. Um, 
this also doesn't mean that you should you should stop striving for being transparent and open. Like you gotta make sure that you revisit that every time and make sure that you you are not uh, you know keeping things for yourself by mistake. You know, you you gotta make sure that you revisit your communication methods to 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 make sure that you're you're saying everything you have to say. So you get you can get rid of surprises. Um, you're not gonna be able to get rid of all the weird faces, but uh, you you gotta try your best for sure. And the reason you're not going to be able to get rid of that is because your community is actually made by humans, and many things can happen in there. And um, people get sick, people have family. Even if they are being paid to work on your project, that doesn't mean they'll they'll be around every time, or they'll be working on it like 24 hours per day. Uh, the communities are made by humans, and and these humans are not like just like computers. Humans are are subject to physics laws, but Unlike computers, humans are also subject to emotions, and or lack thereof, and <laughs> and, and and these emotions many times dictate how we behave in the community. These emotions dictate how how we interact with other people, and and depending on the period period, at least in my case, more often than not, I'm just rage quitting and and flipping tables. You know, but so there there are many there are many times where I'm all like. I don't want to read any more emails. Like I, I don't, I don't even care. Like I'm gonna just take like three weeks off because I'm, you know, I'm burning out here and, and I cannot, you know, tolerate any more, any more of this. And, and this is something you cannot avoid. Like every one of us reacts in different ways. There are people that are thick skin. There are other people that are like half thick skin. There are other people that just like everything gets them. And, and and you gotta acknowledge that. You gotta make sure that you you understand that these humans are also part of your community. So you have to strive to. To you know, make it in, make your community make, make your community to interact in a way that you avoid burnout for these for these people. So if someone misses any communication or any of the processes or changes, it doesn't really mean you're lacking of transparency, but it doesn't uh, also mean that uh, this human is not caring about your community. It turns out that this human is actually human, and there are all the problems that actually get to him or her or to him. Um, and since we're talking about humans, you of course have to strive for diversity. And when I say diversity here, I'm not just talking about gender diversity um, or race diversity. I'm talking about culture. You gotta strive to actually get people from other cultures to your community. Having people from other cultures actually brings a lot to your own community. It brings different perspectives. It, it brings different opinions. It brings different human beings that solve problems in different ways. And you want to have that in your community. You have to strive for it. But as you as you strive for it, you gotta remind yourself that different cultures means different ways to actually address problems, and and that can be useful for your community. But if you're not aware of it, it can be very frustrating, and it can be very it can actually damage your community. Because if you're not if you're not prepared to actually uh, cope with the with the culture gap that you'll have in your community, you'll you'll harm these people, you'll harm these humans that just just don't know how to talk to each other. And this is not this is not their fault, and this is not your fault. This is just something that happens because we are from different cultures. Um, I'm I'm often the noisy, annoying Italian yelling every time, and but it's probably people people probably know that because you know. Italy, but, <laughs> but in many other cases, uh, people just don't know how the cultures are and how the cultures um, work or how the cultures um, address some problems. So you, you, you got to make sure that this, it, is, it is evident for everyone and, and people understand that there are people from other cultures. And especially when it comes to communicating, Turns out that English is not the you know native language in many countries in the world, but for some reason it became the de facto uh, standard uh, language in, in 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 the tech world. Um, and, and English is weird and <laughs> very weird, and, and and it is very hard for people to communicate in a language that is not their native language. If you are not aware of this culture gap, you might just either take words literally, or just say like, fuck it, I don't understand what this guy is saying. And, and this is like, for someone that is not a native English speaker, this is frustrating. You just want to kill, 
feelings when this happens to you. And because we are, you're, you know, you, you, you're trying to actually communicate to someone in a language that is not yours, probably translating in your mind from your language to someone else's language, and you just get nothing out of it, like void. And so you, you gotta make sure that whenever you see these communication, broken communications in your community, uh, you gotta make sure you have processes or people aware enough of this culture gap um, around so that they can actually help out and try to be the medium for, for, uh, for these communications to actually be unbroken. Be aware of the technic uh, technical, Jesus Christ. Uh, be aware of the t time zone gaps. Um, this, this sets like the time zones, time zones are the worst. We, we agree on that. Uh, and yeah, they may be great for you if you're traveling because you get to be, you get to enjoy summer in two different places at the same time, but that's, uh, that's, you know, like, has nothing to do exactly with time zones, but it does make it more interesting. Uh, but, but as, as your community grows, you cannot expect to have, you cannot expect everyone to be in the U.S., uh, for instance. So you gotta make, you gotta understand that there are people that actually live in other countries because we cannot feed an entire world in a single country. Um, and there are time zones. And, and the fact that it is 9 a.m. for you and you, had, you just had your coffee and you just want to talk about how to uh, recompile the entire world, doesn't mean that someone in another country where it's almost midnight uh, uh, you know, wants to talk about it. Um, so it is, it, is, it, is, it is hard to coordinate a community when there are so many time zones in between. Uh, it, gets, it gets very interesting when you try to actually have meetings with people. Uh, you get to know uh, how people go to sleep and what their pajamas look like. And, and yeah, and you, you get to know the people's habits, and some, some are interesting. Uh, but, but keep that in mind. Keep, keep in mind that whenever you are organizing, or whenever you are establishing the processes that you want your, communicate, your community to communicate through, uh, you keep in mind that there are time zones. So if you ask me, like, um, but you're not asking me, but I'll say that anyway. Um, um, we, we use IRC for OpenStack, so we do have some IRC meetings. Um, and, and there's a trade-off in every meeting. We can either have Europeans in the meeting or have Asians in the meeting. We cannot have both. Uh, and this is, this is extremely frustrating. It's like extremely frustrating. So one way we, we deal with this is like we have alternate time slots. So sometimes, it go, sometimes it's gonna be good for Asians and sometimes it's gonna be good for Europeans. Uh, but the US always works for the US. I don't like it, but anyway. Uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, we should turn the world around. That would be interesting. Um, anyway, but use a use a synchronous way. A synchronous means to communicate. Like emails are awesome, but um, but as you use emails, remember that English is not a native language for everyone. So uh, it can take you three seconds to read an email, but it can take five minutes for someone else to actually read an email. So if you have a mailing list that have more than three thousand emails per day, uh, just don't expect people to actually read them all. Uh, it is it is exhausting. So you can you have to choose between reading one email or fixing a bug um, if, if English is not your native language, or even if it is. Um, oh, also when you're communicating times, please use UTC. Like I personally don't care about PST, EDT, and all the US time zones. I'm picking a lot on the US right now because it's. <laughs> I normally have more problem with just Fox when it comes to deciding times. It's like, talk on UTC is easy. You know, I just start from UTC, everyone understands UTC, and if they don't understand, you can easily explain it instead of explaining why the US have four different time frames. Uh, uh, but, but, but again, like, use, use common language. Go to common ground that people can actually um, contribute and understand. And, and again, like, different cultures being different ways to, um, to address problems. Um, Welcome these, these different thinkers. Welcome these different uh, cultures that will help you with, uh, with addressing problems in different ways. Some people, some people solve problems by just getting a gazillion of developers and to fix a single bug. Some other people prefer just having one person to actually understand the bug and then explaining it to other people. Some people just don't want to fix bugs. Uh, <laughs> and you understand that different cultures have different ways to address 
um, these, these problems, whatever problem you have. I, I keep talking about bugs and code because that, that's what I deal the most with. But it can be you know, social issues in your community. Um, dealing with jerks, that is not something easy because you have to tell a jerk that he's being a jerk. You know, what can you expect from that? And, and you know, like, welcome them and understand the different ways they, they, there are for, for addressing issues and understand that some issues are, also, are probably better to be addressed in, in, in a certain way and some other issues are probably better to be addressed in other ways. And emotions matter. Emotions matter a lot. Um, again, we're humans. Uh, we, 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 we have emotions. Even if you say you don't have, you have emotions. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go as far as saying that lacking of emotions is actually an emotion. Um, you can, again, like, you cannot tell people how to behave. Uh, sorry, you can tell people how to behave, but you cannot tell people how to think. Um, you cannot tell people to not feel or to, to don't be frustrated. It's like, it's my fault that you need to know your native language. Don't be frustrated. But you cannot tell people that. Um, you can tell them how to behave in your community, but you can also help them. Uh, this doesn't mean that you have to have a, you know, therapist group in your in your community that will, you know, be the psychoanalyst in your community and you know help everyone. I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying like be aware that people have bad days. You know, people have emotions. Uh, we feel right, so when we react to those feelings, we 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 act in different ways. Um, one rule I have is that I never I never reply to emails when I'm angry, um, most of the time, and uh, and I don't I don't reply to emails late at night for two reasons. Late at night I'm all, I'm very likely going to rage quit and I'm very tired and probably drunk, um, and and if, if if I'm angry I'm just gonna say a whole lot of things that I don't really want to say and I don't really mean. So, but understand that not everyone reacts the same way. Again, like. When, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm angry to, to some email, I'll just like start writing and then I read it and I'm like, I probably shouldn't send this. Uh, also, never put the, the, never fill in the to feel in the email uh, if you don't really mean to send it because you can accidentally send it. Um, and this is not good. <laughs> Been there, done that. Um, but just essentially remember you're all humans, you're all humans. and, and and you'll feel, and even if you say you don't, you, you definitely feel. Um, not everyone reacts the same way. And again, as, 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 just like you have a COC team that is you know, ready to react on, on, on people not behaving correctly, you should be able to make sure that you have enough members in your community that, that understand that the community is actually made by human and or made of humans, and, and that can also help you when, when things happen. And assume good faith. That's some good faith about everyone, and and this again goes back like you cannot tell people how to feel and how, the, how to think. And assuming good faith is actually telling people how to think about things. Um, you might choose not assume good faith about people, and it's fine. I personally prefer to because it makes my life easier. Instead of trying to figure out where the catch is and why these people is trying to put me over, I just assume that these is, these guys or these people are not trying to put me over. So I just assume good faith when people come up to mailing lists, IRC channels, and everything and communicate things that might not look good, uh, but it's easier to just assume good faith. You might choose not to, but the fact that you choose not to assume good faith doesn't mean that you have to spread it all out in the social medias and, and, and send it on the mailing list. That the fact that you don't assume good faith doesn't mean that you have to reply to these guys and say like, hey, I think you're just trying to fuck everyone over, uh, because that might not be true. So you'll end up being the guy that was actually, or girl that was actually wrong. Um, and again, like, it just makes the community uh, healthier by uh, if, if you just assume good faith about everyone. Um, again, this, is, this is a personal choice. Um, we, we, we have different past. We, we, again, we react in different ways to certain things, and we prefer to think about certain things in different ways. Some people want to assume good faith, some others don't. Um, Again, like I personally, I prefer to some good faith. I would, I would recommend you to do that. But if you don't, uh, just make sure you don't you don't spread it all out on, on you know the mediums that your entire community is actually using to communicate, because it is not healthy for your community. And be you know, watch tribal thinking uh, is uh, so tribal thinking. 
as as your community grow, you can you you kind of like expect the rest of the community not really expect you kind of assume the community knows how the community actually works because it is growing you have new members and you know things seem to be working and soon enough you'll start having tribal thinking in your community you'll start having things that you assume everyone knows and everyone agrees with but turns out they don't so beware of it beware of, of what things you consider your own principles in your community, what things you have as, as expectations that are not written down somewhere, and make sure that you know those tribal you know, things that you, you believe can also evolve and can also be changed. Get encourage in, your community, get, get, get your community to actually uh, contribute to it. Make sure you, you talk about those things that you believe all the community agree with very often, so that you can check if, if, if it is actually true or not. If it is not true, be ready to change it. And if it is true, well, you're lucky, one in a million. Um, but be aware of tribal thinking. It is, it is very harmful for your community, especially when, you, when your tribal thinking dates to more than three years. And for three years, you've been assuming that your entire community agreed on some things that it turns out they don't agree with. And many humans uh, wear many different hats in your community. And this goes beyond the different people have different roles in the same community. Turns out that different people may also have different roles outside of the community. In my case, I'm being paid by Red Hat to actually work on OpenStack, right? So OpenStack is the community I'm part of. Red Hat is the company that actually hired me and they're the company that you know, gets me my paycheck, basically. Um, or sends me a paycheck. I get my paycheck. Um, yeah, checked out last month. And, and many people wear multiple hats. You know, like I have a role in my, in, in, my, in my company. I have a role at Red Hat and something I'm responsible for. Uh, but I also have a role in the community and something I'm responsible for in the community, which doesn't necessarily have to match what I'm responsible for at Red Hat. And the fact that I'm part of Red Hat or the fact that I'm part of the OpenStack community doesn't mean I have to quit one of them. But it means that I have different hats that I have to wear from time to time, and I have to switch between them. And I was told once that the many hats, um, the many hats theory is, is not really true, like you always wear all your hats at all times. I actually disagree with that. Um, because you have to disagree with that if you really want your community to succeed. You, you have to be aware that sometimes your hats um, uh, your hats uh, they have to be switched and some of the hats that you wear cannot be used um, in some of the roles that you have in the community. For instance, I'm part of the technical committee in OpenStack. And, and as part of the technical committee, my responsibility is to make the best decisions for the community, or try to. I might fail many times, but as part of this committee, I'm, I'm responsible for thinking for the community and not for the company I uh, work for. So it is, it is often, and it, it is hard, but I have many times to just say, you know what, even if X would be useful for Red Hat, turns out that X is not useful for the community, so I'm gonna do whatever is best for the community because that's my responsibility here. Some roles allow for that and some roles are done. If you don't feel like your role at, Red, uh, at your company, not really Red Hat, well, if you wanna work at Red Hat, we're hiring. Uh, <laughs> and if, if you, if your role at, the at your company doesn't allow you to actually switch hats, then don't take responsibilities in your community that will require you to do that. It is fine still that you can still affect the outcomes of the things happening in your community if you really have to, but it is fine to just don't, to, to just don't be part of some things if you really can't, if your company doesn't allow you to do that, if your responsibilities doesn't, don't allow you to do that. Um, Sometimes, like really, sometimes you just have to put a community first. That's one of the principles that, that unless we have in, in OpenStack, it would be great if you have it in your own community. Um, put the community first, and then put your company, and then put your project. Um, if you, again, like if your role at your company doesn't allow you to do that, it's fine. Just don't take positions in your community that will require you to. Build a community of doers. Make sure that the processes allow people for doing things, for changing stuff. Many people, uh, so, 
you can you can you can paste your community into Docracy if you will. So Docracy is basically if you do stuff, you are actually known and you are actually get to do other stuff. Um, being radical there is not very good. You know, like just basing your community on Docracy and not having elections and all that kind of things. It's kind of a harm your community. You have to have a balance between all these fancy ways to actually build communities and establish who has the rights to do stuff or not in your community. So. Um, Make sure that other people, that these newcomers, that these different cultures are also being benefited by the things that are happening in your community. Don't, don't expect to everyone, uh, for everyone to submit the same number of patches uh, or, or send this, this, the same amount of emails. Because that doesn't mean you're actually doing something for your community. That's, we'll get to that, but that's just basically statistics and then you can cheat that very easily. So make sure you have Make sure you are aware of emotions, make sure you have a way for people to actually do things, and, and make sure that your community and your processes are, are built in a way that, that you have a community of doers, or people that is feeling, uh, is willing to do stuff for your community and improve it. And there will be renters. There will be, there will be a lot of people that are just there to, uh, telling you and reminding you what's not right about your community, and that's fine. Um, you know, like, I don't think people that rant a lot and do nothing are actually bad people. Like, they have opinions and those opinions are sometimes are useful and sometimes they're not. It is very annoying to just have people that just complain about things and do nothing. Um, we, we, strive for, we strive for having people that, not, you know, like, if you complain about something, please help out and fix it. If you cannot fix it yourself, at least try to find someone that can do it, uh, you know, around the community and work with them. Or at least do something. Just don't don't throw things on Twitter because it is fancy and people will follow you for that. And and you know like and renters will be there. You, you you have them because most of the times, many times the renters are also the users of your software and you don't want to, you know, push them away. You still want to have them in your community. But make sure again like these renters are have a way to, to be part of the change. Um, they might not want to, you know, fix all the bugs and fix all the issues that you have in your community because you might have many of them. But make sure that there's a way for these renters to communicate properly their opinions, communicate properly their, their thoughts, and that those thoughts are actually being heard or, or act on, if you will. And I, automate, automate all the things. Like we, we like automating things because we're lazy people, uh, people, and we're lazy humans, and, and, and we don't like to, to work either. Um, but um, but automate governance processes. Um, when whatever whatever the process is, if it is if it is submitting a change on how the community behaves, submitting a change to the expectations, submitting a change to to whatever, just have a way to automate those processes as much as you can, because that will help you to make those processes more objective, because you can actually um, you can actually act on those in, in a very rational way, if you will. And processes that cannot be automated are normally um, most likely subjective processes um, because you don't have a good way to, to measure those changes. Like we have this um, tagging system in, in OpenStack to, to apply some, some tags or some categories to some of the projects. So like, do, do, does the project support rolling upgrades? Does the project support upgrades at all? Does the project, you know, like do this and that? And uh, does the project have stable branches? And we have processes for, for classifying and categorizing those projects. And this is very, this is, it's quite simple to do that. We can automate that. But we can also, we also have a tag that says whether the project is a, a single vendor. A single vendor means that just one company contributes to the project or one uh, set of people are actually contributing to the project. So applying these tags is actually, um, so the, the single vendor one is, is, is a very subjective process. Like you can, you can automate it. You can build scripts that basically calculate how many people are contributing to the project. But again, like statistics, you know, those numbers, you know, lines of code, uh, and lines of code, and, and reviews, and emails, and those are things that you can. Those are things that you can actually cheat. You know, that I can I can build a robot that sends a lot of emails. You know, and me saying this is not assuming good faith, and I know that. But the the point is that. The, the reason I'm saying this is because if you cannot automate your processes, uh, it likely means you are making subjective decisions. Sometimes it is good, but try to avoid those as much as possible. Um, but don't, don't leave the mission or vision of your community in the hands of a robot. 
right? So there are, there are decisions, there are things, there are changes and processes that have to be subjective and that you have to actually have human interaction and human brains to think about it and make decisions and, and move them forward. And stats are not always a, a source of objectivism. Like I said before, right? you, can, you can change many things. Like, I can send a huge patch that has a gazillion lines of code changes and like I delete a whole bunch of code and I add a whole lot more. Um, but but again, like you, you basing basing um, all the objective decisions or subjective decisions on some of these uh, statistics is not uh, very reliable many times. And and actually, stats indicate that stats uh, are not good. This is basically the Mark Twain's phrase translated to stats. Like every uh, every generalization is false, including this one. Well, that's this is the, the statistical version of it. Um, when it comes to making decisions, um, this is actually true. Um, you, you can, there are some stats that are useful for your community, it's like how diverse it is, how many different cultures we have, how can we help this, the minority to actually become, not necessarily the majority, but just to increase the number. Um, you know, how, how, can we, how can we improve the way we communicate? We're, we're sending like 3,000 emails per day. That's insane for many people. Like, how do you even follow that? We, you, you can you can discuss like bike shade is the thing that we love the most. So uh, bike shading and and you know like how much bike shading we're doing in the community. How can we how can we just like remove some of that bike shading and, and try to uh, have more constructive conversations? Those are stats that are actually useful. Whether you submitted 500 changes or just one, it doesn't really matter. It's not really important because you can be contributing to your community in different ways. Like, I've not sent many patches lately. I've, I've not been coding a lot in the last couple of months. That doesn't mean I'm not doing my work for the community. I just decided to do something different in the last uh, couple of cycles for my community. And that is fine. You, got, you have to be aware of that. So, wrapping it up, because I have like minus five minutes. Um, Give humans a number and they'll make it impossible to make it grow, except for the credit card balance. And some will do that as well. Um, so again, number of comments, emails, lines of codes, that's not useful. That's, you, you, you're not gonna do that. You're not gonna take anything useful from that except for saying how well your community is doing as a general number. But even that, it doesn't mean anything. You can have three million comments in your product and your software can still be crap. So, so if you're gonna use stats, if you're if you're actually gonna measure things and get metrics, did you just okay? Did okay. you just check me out? I'm Italian, amazing. Get up to that. And, and, well, anyway, like if you're gonna measure things, uh, make sure those are uh, actually useful things for for your community. And community growth growth has has to do with uh, many things. Um, it's it's you know it's like it's like a startup. You know, like for your community, you want it to grow, you want people to actually use it. But and it's having, a five, having a community of five people or 10 people or even 100, it is fine. You don't have to get to 1,000 people to actually consider your community to be successful or to actually have processes for your community. Some communities don't. Some communities are not supposed to have that many users because of the software, because of the problem they're solving. So understand what problem you're solving. Understand uh, you know, like how big is the market for your community, if you will, if you want to put it in those terms. And, and remember, like, like, not every community is supposed to have a gazillion of contributors, but the fact that you have five or 10 doesn't mean that your community is failing or that you don't have to have actual processes for, for managing it and making it grow. And the processes will, will evolve as your, as your community grows. And, and you, gotta, you gotta revisit all your processes uh, from time to time and make sure that you can change those. Uh, the way you vote for people, the way you you, again, like the way you communicate, the way you, you send patches, and uh, the license agreement. Um, what kind of licenses is your software being licensed with? Or, or how often do you meet on, on IRC or on, on other means? Uh, you gotta revisit all those processes to make sure that you're, uh, you're not leaving anyone out of, 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 of your community by not uh, changing some of the things, like time zones, like you know, cultural gaps, like um, assuming good faith about people and being aware of emotions, all those products, all those um, little pieces that constitute your community. You gotta revisit those very often. So you make sure that you're including everyone and you strive for diversity. 
And like Gil Zulu said once, um, technology is, is, is social before it is technical. Um, keep that in mind. Um, there's, you can have the coolest software ever, but if you don't have humans in your community, there's no community. So make sure you keep in mind all the social aspects for, of your community and, and that you, you address those even before you address all your bugs because you know, without humans, there's no one that's actually gonna fix bugs. And also, say thanks to many people. Thanks, say thanks all the time to everyone. The fact that I'm, some people are being paid to actually contribute to a project doesn't mean they don't, you know, they, they're not to be thanked because you know, they're getting money out of it. It doesn't really matter. Like, I could choose to do something different. Like I could say, like I don't want to contribute to this project anymore, even if I'm being paid for. It. So, say thanks to people. It is super important. I acknowledge that you have humans in your community, and these humans have emotions, and they are dedicating time of their lives to actually make your project succeed or your community succeed. So, be thankful, thankful about that. And with that, I'll just thank you all and close this uh, presentation. Thanks.